that it was wrong. And he couldn't get across to them that what's taking place when a man is having any kind of incestual relationship, whether it's his mother-in-law, which this was, his stepmother, and was having a sexual relationship, and the church condoned it. Now when that takes place, the church itself becomes guilty. And it's guilty because they're turning their heads, and, and that just could not be. So God is speaking to us about that tonight and letting us realize that these people are really didn't have an, quite an understanding. And sometimes, and I'm going to say it again so you understand, so many misquotations of the Apostle Paul. And, and you're going to see that. Uh, people, people would listen or read it, and they'd just change whatever it is to, to their own benefit, thinking... That's what they were doing. Now, tonight you're going to see in just a moment about what I'm talking about. When Jesus was eating with sinners and publicans and all that, he was chastised for that. He said, you, what are you doing eating with sinners? And, and, you know, he said, plain and simple, he said, you know, it's, it's not the well who needs a doctor, it's those that are sick. And he's referring to the sinner. Now, the publicans, well, basically he's talking about the tax collectors. But when you take a look at the Pharisees, the Pharisees were coming on strong about everything that he did. And he was basically stayed under, just completely under the microscope to stop him and whatever he was doing to discredit him. But tonight, we need to understand something. The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the church at Corinth. And when he did, they misunderstood it. Now let me tell you something. This is not the only misunderstanding. There's been, and I'll tell you, coming out of Dallas Seminary uh, when I was in Jacksonville to the pastor's conference several years ago, five things they talked about of a misunderstanding in the churches that's carried out that's wrong in Paul's quotations. And so they brought these out, and they were really good and strong. But I just want to start, now we start on page 41, and about the middle of the page where it says next. So next, Paul clears up a misunderstanding by writing, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Now I'm going to stop right there a minute. Do you know why? Well, the first thinking in terms is, well, I, I can't have association unless you're saved. Well, how are they going to be saved if somebody don't invite them to church or tell them that, you know, there's a thing for Jesus? But Paul's not meaning you can't associate. Paul's just saying that you shouldn't socialize with these folks. They're going to intimidate you. You're not going to intimidate them. And that's what was the fear, and that's what God had already told us. But Paul had evidently written a previous letter to the Corinthians that has not survived. In it, he apparently told them not to company with immoral people, referring to those in the church who are practicing horrible sin, such as confronted in this chapter. Now, the word translated company means to mix with and refers to a close relationship. Therefore, when a professing believer becomes involved in sexual immorality, we cannot act as though their sinful behavior is acceptable. We've seen that with Bill Clinton in the White House. I mean, the examples of things that are taking place today is absolutely astounding. And I mean, uh, passing a, a law that same-sex marriage. Let me tell you something. Our, our, our entire government is corrupt. And when I say corrupt, I'm not talking about in the, the ongoing good old buddy days where I'll do you and you do for me. It, it's gone into God's Word and it's almost like they're thumbing their nose up at God and saying, we're not going to listen to what you have to say. We're going to, we, we care more about uh, being elected than we do our souls. And that's true. They have sold their soul to have a title. And that's a sad thing. And, and you know who's going to uh, suffer for that? You and I. You know why? They're going to call you hate mongers. See, when they pass that law, they passed it for a reason. And it is more than you realize. That law is going to come down the line to the Christian people and say, I don't care what you think. This is law, 
and you can be arrested for in any manner of any kind of threat. You know, a lot of people say you can't be arrested by threat. Well, you better read some of the new laws because I can assure you right now that if I get up publicly in our church and I start throwing off on the LGBT, uh, they can easily come into our church and say, well, your pastor's going to be arrested because he is a hate monger. Uh, we want peace, and that's what he wants to do. Now, I'm going to leave that open for a discussion if you got anything you want to say or add to that. Well, what they're going to go after, in my opinion, Leroy, is the, the tax status of a church. And they'll try to go against the pocketbook. Well, that's right. There's a whole lot of things that, that's going to affect the church by these laws that are being passed. And so you have to be... Now listen to me. I will not stop preaching God's Word. I'm serious. God is God, and I can tell you right now that if we turn our backs, we'll do the same thing. We want our church, whether it pleases God or not. And that's the danger. And that's what you're going to see in the last days, where the church will become the will of the people instead of the will of God. And so the government is forcing this on in so many different avenues that you have to be very careful about these laws that are being passed. We already have uh, some denominations oh, yeah? are splitting, oh. pulling out. Presbyterian Church? Methodist. Who would have ever thought the Presbyterian Church would do it? The Methodist? Well, the Episcopal Church has a, a, a lesbian, uh, how do they want to say that, a head of it. Uh, she's, she's a lesbian, practicing lesbian. Oh, yeah. Well, it's kind of believable that the church would be willing to do that. Here's where, here's where I want to tell you what took place in, in California. There was a writing where a woman had a website, and uh, she was a, a minister. She had been ordained, and all she'd done was marry. She didn't preach. So it was a website where she refused to marry same sexes. Well, they sued her, and she went all the way to the Supreme Court, and California itself uh, had, had condemned her for it, but when she got to the Supreme Court, Thank the Lord we got some conservatives there right now. Right now. And who knows how long before they, they turn the other way. But the point is, they said that she had a right to practice her religion and because it offended her religion and her rights, they didn't have to do it. But <clears throat> if in some other little uh, check mark there was that if she turns around and, and starts talking against the LGBT or same-sex marriages, then she would lose her rights and, and she'd have to be forced to get either do it or be fined or uh, taken down. Now, that's what it's come up. Now, why? Now, you see, it's got so it's, it's a tick for tack for tick for tack to they look and find the loopholes in every manner they can. But the sad thing about it is the Apostle Paul was saying, you know, y'all misunderstood me about not having a socialization with, with fornicators. He's talking about sinners. And, and here's what the facts are. You'll see what he's talking about here. And he's saying it. He said these are immoral people and referring to those in the church who are practicing horrible sin such as confronted in this chapter. And the word translated Company means to mix with, refers to a close relationship. Therefore, when a professing believer becomes involved in sexual immorality, we cannot act as though their sinful behavior is acceptable. Now, let me tell you something. One of the things that will take place uh, is pastors has got to uh, understand that they have to obey God's Word. And there's too much flexibility in, in a lot of the churches today. That's why that's happening here. They care more about the will of the people than they do the will of God. In other words, you're going to see what's happening. That's why the Presbyterian churches are poor. I mean, they, they used to be one of the most fantastic uh, religious 
uh, denominations around. I mean, as far as power, they they had a, a strict code and everything. Now, my point is made that when they started opening the door because their poor attendance. Now, here's here's where we stand in danger. When we have poor attendance and we want to build up our attendance, we open the door and say, everybody, come on in. Now, that's fine if we're going to preach the Word of God. But if it offends them, they'll leave. And you have to realize, see, if somebody, you know, the deacons turn around and say, Pastor, we're going to have to let up on some of this hell stuff and this thing's here. We're going to have to allow these people in. We need the revenue. has nothing to do with God. And they, this is how a man turns around and heads down the wrong road. And so it is with the church. Now, if you want to get a little understanding, you read about those seven churches in the book of Revelation and stop meditate because I'm going to tell you something. Regardless of what they have, about every one of them you're going to see in all seven of those churches, there's a remnant in every single one that God knows are truly believers. Now, when you start doing that, you see everybody thinks they're the church of Philadelphia, the brotherly love. Everything is supreme. And everybody wants their church to be that. And you see, then, then you got the church of Sardis, the angry church. Well, it's so amazing to me that Joe and I go up Highway 10 and there's a Lutheran church called Sardis Lutheran Church. And I said... There's the angry church, Joe. <laughs> it's funny how most, of, if you take a look at the Lutheran churches, my friend, most of them are, have biblical names. It's not no uh, Ridgeview Lutheran church. You just won't see it. So you see that they're, they're really strict about it. But there's all of this that's taking place on exactly what Christ said about leaven. When you start allowing that into the church and they become officers in the church and they're teaching in the church and it makes no difference even if you put them in the pulpit. I'm trying to get across to you something. It works its way through the whole leaven until the whole loaf is what? Rotten. It's not worth eating. So understand that that's where Satan's plans are and he's getting there. Now, Paul clarifies what he meant in the earlier letter, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetousest or extortioners or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. Apparently the church cut off contact with unbelievers. Instead of unrepentant believers, that's not what Paul meant. So what do the Pharisees ask Jesus' disciples to do in Matthew 9 verse 11? Well, the Pharisees in general didn't want, and they wouldn't. They would not eat. They would not in no manner. Listen, if a sinner would serve them a cup of something, they wouldn't touch it unless it was wiped off. That's how strict they were. They were very, very strict. And so you see here that God is saying that that you're not to you're not to associate. You're not to have a a camaraderie. There's social type of of things. But listen to me. What if we didn't associate with sinners? Well, we're all sinners, but we're talking about those that are saved that, uh, by grace. And now here we are. How are we going to do this? How are we going to uh, have a, a relationship? Well, you know, I'll be frank with you. I played uh, golf with guys that uh, <coughs> cursed, drank. Uh, one sings in the Presbyterian church. And he's smoking dope. I mean, all of this. I mean, and you know what? I talked to him. What am I? What am I supposed to do? Well, I sort of couldn't help but think about man Scott who was down at the beach. I can't remember the whole story, but uh, he was tickled to death that they were going to put he and I with two lesbians. And Scott said, "Oh Lord, are we in trouble now? The preacher's going to play." Well, instead, he gave us a guy that we still witnessed to for 18 holes, didn't we? 
But anyway, it was amazing that how some people react. Now, Jesus came to heal the sick and open the eyes of the blind. And let me tell you something. Every single one of us, our eyes, if you're a Christian, has been opened by the Lord. He says they're sick and are in need of healing. So what part are we playing in bringing sinners to Jesus? That's an important question. Now, like Jesus, we should be among unbelievers to win them, not be of them. Now, somebody says, David... uh, Let's go have a beer together. And he says, no. He said, well, at least go with me. Well, you've got to beware here. He said, well, I'll just go over there and I'll witness. Now, I'm going to tell you again, Christ warned us that the world is going to intimidate us instead of us intimidate the world. And, and I'm hearing pastors say we've come to win the world. God did not say that. God has made it very plain he's come to save sinners those that would come. The church in itself is not going to be able to save the world. And for anybody to bring that about is wrong. They need to be a witness uh, about the Lord and let the Lord take care of it. So many times we want to move the Holy Spirit out of the way and the Holy Spirit is the one that's going to do the convicting. And we're going to try to convict them ourselves. Well, that is flesh. That is not Holy Spirit. That is not God-driven, and that's what we have to understand. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such as one know not to eat. Now, you, you have to see here that it's easy for us to turn around and say, uh, somebody says, hey, pastor, would you come and have breakfast with us? And I'm saying, I know that person's life, and uh, it was like mine at one time. So I just can't go eat with them. Is that what he mean? Well, you see, the thing about it is that's how they misunderstand Paul. He's basically saying you're not to socialize. In other words, today I'm with him, tomorrow I'll be with him, the next day I'll be with him. I just can't do it without him. We go play golf together. We have this together. Men and our wives go out and eat with them. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about the plain thing of making a social life with people that you need to witness to. You know, I come out, of, before I got out of seminary, you know one of the things that they were trying to teach? Don't be friends with anybody in church. And I said, Why? Jesus was friends with his disciples. How could he not be a friend? And you're saying that a pastor is not... He said, well, the whole thing is you don't want to have a social life with the people that you're teaching. I don't agree. Now, mind you, that pastor, uh, that professor didn't last too long because how can you, how can you have a good church if you don't have a good relationship with one another I mean you got to have that God talks about God talks about what we should do in fellowship and that fellowship should be together we're to be one in Christ so how in the world can you teach to be two in Christ you can't be with them but you got to be one in Christ now when I asked that question he dismissed the class he didn't say nothing he just turned around and walked right out of the class So tell me something. You think I'm wrong? I don't think so. You have to show me where it says any way different, but we're to be one in Christ. When a marriage comes together, a man and a woman, what does God say they're to be? One. Flesh. So when we come to Jesus, and actually that's what we're doing by baptism, we're saying, I'm married to Jesus. So what happens there? We're to be two different people? No, we're to be one in Christ Jesus. So a lot of this is misunderstood, and that was one of the things that I was mentioning. Notice the phrase that is called a brother. This means he calls himself a brother, which leaves room for doubt about the person's salvation. Only God knows for sure. At any rate, we're not to company with such people in a way as suggest their sin is acceptable a part of Christian life. Let me ask you a question. How many people that you know right now that you call brother, and then you regularly actually know that can't be my brother, he's not saved? 
Now, what, how, does that, how does he become my brother? Well, we're born from above. Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Amen? Well, what happened? We're born from above by one Father. And it has to come from up there. Not the church, not the preacher, not anybody. Man can't have a second birth. It has to come from God. And a lot of people think they have it and they don't have it. God looks down and sees whether or not you have it. In other words, what he does is he, he at that time sees the sincerity of your heart. He knows you meaning that you want to ask God to forgive you of your sin. And he accepts that. By that you're born again. Now what happened? Well, we go off now. Uh, Joe goes down and he gives his life to the Lord. That makes me and him brothers. Now, when you turn around and call somebody a brother, you better know who you're talking about. Because if you don't, and that person is not what you think, they might be a Mormon, they might be a Jehovah Witness, and, and they might be devout, talking about the Lord and everything else, but you might find out that they don't see the Holy Spirit as being a person. They don't see Jesus as being God. They believe that they have to work for their religion. In other words, you have to be very careful who you call him brother. Because God holds us accountable to the things we support. And when we call them brother, that means that we're going to support them like a brother. And don't, don't call them a brother or a sister if they are not born again. So regarding sin, God allows no room for compromise. Not associating with people who call themselves believers, but are practicing sin. And it's a form of church discipline designed to bring them to repentance. James writes about restoring someone who errs from the truth. And one convert, and you know, God was very upset, Jesus was very upset with the Pharisees. He says, when you do proselyte, when you do... Uh, bring somebody they're twice as bad as you are now why did he say that because you see they were hypocrites you got that but these that were converted to judaism they're twice i mean there's no hypocritical point of them they were absolutely sold out sincere that that was the way to get to heaven it was being a judaizer now, I told you Sunday morning, and I meant it. I couldn't help it. That no Jew that believes in Jesus Christ can be a citizen of Israel. That is in their law. Passed December the 25th, 1990. No Messianic Jew can be a citizen of Israel. Look it up. It's something that just broke my heart. And that is terrible. What are they saying? They say that an atheist. You know Israel has more atheists per capita than any other nation on earth. That'll shock you, isn't it? That'll shock you. You say, wait a minute. How about Buddhism? Well, they believe that in Buddhism. I'm talking about they believe in a God. I'm talking about an atheist who believes in no God. Christy Alley just found out what Scientology is. She died last week. And she was just on fire for Scientology. I mean, the New Agers. And, and let me tell you, that meant that everybody was God. Not associating with people who call themselves believers, but are practicing sin as a form of church discipline designed to bring them to repentance. Now, James writes about restoring someone who errs from the truth and one convert him. Now, what is the motivation according to James 5.20? Well, the wonder of justification is, now listen to me, I'm justified. The devil comes along and says, don't you remember what you used to do? Do you remember when you was down on the golf course and you was using God's name in vain? Yeah, but I've been justified and I'm no longer that. Oh, yeah, well, you, you know, everybody knows that to you. Well, I'm not judged by men. I'm judged by God. And God says that if I've justified your sins... You have to understand that I've forgiven them. You don't go in the back and in the past and bring them up of something God's forgiven you for. What you do is you're saying, God, I just don't believe you forgave me. 
we begin to doubt the justification of God. So we have to understand that cannot be. We have to go by what? Faith. Faith. Even though sometimes we feel like we're lost as a, as a goose in a hailstorm, I can assure you one thing. If God says you're forgiven, friend, it don't make no difference how your feelings are because your feelings are the shallowest point of your being. And you can count on that. That's why the good example of that was Peter says, oh, we don't fish in the deep, Lord. We fish in the shallows. We trap the fish in the shallows. That's how we fish. And he says, cast out into the deep. Now, Peter had his doubt, but he said, but since you say so, what happened? They caught more fish than they could, uh, they could do. The nets began to break. Now notice later on how that, next time, they didn't tell you how many fish they caught, but the next time, the last time, when he had called them to be disciples, called 153. Now, a lot of things has been said for what that meaning is, but here's the deal. The nets didn't break. You see, there's a lot of people escaped because they were going by what they thought and the Holy Spirit's involved. And when Jesus made them fishers, He was showing them that those that are saved are saved and the net don't break in the forgiveness of sin. God is forgiving you. He continues to forgive you without any doubt whatsoever. Do we walk perfectly? No. And, and a lot of people think that you can lose your salvation. I got news for you. My God is not an abortionist. If I've been saved and I've been born again, He does not abort me for Him to go back to the cross and have to shed His blood all over again so I can get born again. That is the most ridiculous thing in Scripture that some of these churches preach and teach and will stand on their life about it They'll take one verse or a couple of verses and as part of the Scriptures and do just exactly like they've done with Paul. Do you know one of the greatest enemies of the church is people that think they know and they do not know anything. They're teaching on their opinions. They have a religion, but they don't have that relationship and the Holy Spirit of God directing and leading them. I'm going to have to stop right there. I didn't run over it. Paul continues. Any questions or comments? I knew what my dad always said when uh, we were questioning of why we needed to do this or should we do that. He said, if you snuggle with the dog with fleas, you're going to get fleas. <laughs> that's the truth. And that's it. That's that's it. Absolutely. All right. Well, Dave, we're glad you're here tonight. You come back. All right. Scott, you want to dismiss us? Your Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, for this time we had to come together to study your word. Lord, we just miss those that are not here tonight. A lot of them sick, those who lost loved ones. Those that uh, just couldn't get out of mind in the weather, whatever it may be, Lord, just touch them. Let them know, Lord, that we're thinking of them and praying for them. Lord, just be with those on our prayer list, Lord. We have many. And God, just uh, prepare our hearts for uh, our worship on Sunday. We have pastors that will prepare, and each Sunday school teacher, each person has a part of it. Lord, we just uh, want to leave tonight saying, Amen.